let's keep going down the rabbit hole of models that you can run locally on your computer. We often think of AI as being something that has to happen out there, right? It takes a whole lot of GPUs. It takes a whole lot of processing. It takes a whole lot of money. We think of these super well-funded companies like, you know, OpenAI um, or its, its, its competitor, uh, Anthropic. Um, and the... Um, or, or, or Cohere or Area 21 or all, all these others, right? They're amazing. All this crazy amounts of money. But, but there's an alternative to this, uh, which is the universe of open source models uh, that are available to us today. And uh, in a previous video, I talked about how we could, you know, access those relatively easy in something called LM Studio. But I want to go down that rabbit hole just a little bit more here and talk about Olama, which is a lower level way of accessing local models using the same fundamental DGUF technology and talk a little bit how you can bring your own custom models to bear in there. Now, the idea behind Olama is that they are focused just on how to connect your local model uh, with uh, something you can run. And it uses a standard called GGUF, uh, which uh, basically means that they have a, a library of models they know have been translated into GIGA format uh, that you can then run locally on your computer. So we have, you know, access to Llama 2, access to Mistral, uh, and then like, you know, lots and lots and lots of others. And as we'll see in a couple of minutes, you can actually uh, tell uh, Olama to use any of these open source models once you download them to your local machine. The interface is not as friendly as it is in LM Studio uh, because it's all really working off of a command line. So let me bring up this command line over here and we can do, you know, Olama uh, run Llama uh, 2, you know. Um, well, actually, what I can do is just do an Olama list to show what I've actually downloaded. Uh, and, you know, Olama always use dash dash help to find out how a given program wants to be run. And this is all available to me, by the way, because the very first thing you can do with Olama is just right from their homepage, uh, you can just download it. Uh, directly to your computer and, you know, install it. And one of the very cool things is once you've installed it, it actually installs a little bit of a, um, a server into memory. And that's the reason why you have this uh, llama up here in your, uh, in your address bar. Um, but, you know, and, and right now it's only for Mac OS. Uh, they say they're coming out with Windows relatively soon. So if you're Windows, uh, you want to be looking at uh, LM Studio, which is Mac and Windows. If you are Mac OS, you would, can use either of these. And it seems like Olama also supports Linux on a first class basis, uh, whereas that's more beta over on LM Studio. I haven't actually experimented with uh, either of these things on Linux just yet, although I think that gets to be a pretty cool way this thing can proceed. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, what we find here in the terminal. Uh, and the, um, and, and the, one of the most straightforward things we can do is just pull one of these models uh, from the registry. And to do that, you just need to know what model you're pulling. And that's where uh, these names come in. Or you can reference a, a local one. We'll talk about that in just a minute, like how you can create your own. Uh, and then we can uh, say, well, let's, uh, you know, Olama run. Olama uh, 2. And it will kind of preload the thing into memory so that we can start asking it questions. Like we can ask questions like, um, you know, uh, make a, a good uh, description for a YouTube video discussing local large language models, and it will just, you know, calculate and it will run it. This is all happening entirely on my computer. There is nothing that's going up to the cloud, nothing that's going over to OpenAI or to anyone else. And here is making me a whole bunch of description, uh, which might be, you know, more than we really care for, but it can be relatively useful. Now, the question is, like, are these model outputs going to be relevant to you? And, and that's going to be a question of, you know, the usual thing, figuring out which model you want to use. And now, of course, instead of just using OpenAI, you can use any of these. Uh, and then the, um, and then you can say bye. You know, be done. Uh, and you can use open. Uh, so, so instead of having to go send things over to open AI, it's all happening locally. You get to choose one of these models or bring your own to the party. Um, and, um, and, and really the only price that you pay for it is going to be speed, uh, that these models uh, are quite large and this formatting allows them to run on CPUs instead of GPUs. Uh, but the things are generally going to run more slowly than they do when they're just running off in the, um, a uh, run off in the cloud, but that's, probably fine. Uh, there's a lot that we can do with that. Now, 
I got pretty excited about this technology um, and I got excited about it in sort of a couple different directions. The first is the ability to bring whatever model you want to bear. Now, the, the shopping list and, and search functionality sitting over in LM Studio is pretty great. It's a bit more limited over here. They just have their known registry of models. But you can also, if we were to click into their GitHub, it's their GitHub uh, page, uh, you can, you know, scroll down and you can say you can import, um, you know, your own model. Now, there are a couple ways of doing this. You can import it directly from PyTorch, but the best way to do this, I think, is to have converted the thing into GGuff first, and that can be a whole different conversation. But if you have a GGuff model that you might have downloaded from Hugging Face, or maybe you copied it over from like the cache directory in uh, Elm Studio or whatever, you can say you want to use it in Olama. And you do that by creating what they call a model file. Now, the way you do this is like if I just say ls, um, you can see here I've got this, um, you know, th this model I had previously created and fine-tuned. I, I used it as an example in a, in a previous video as well. Uh, and I can, you know, code model file, right, to, which will then create something called model file, right? And I can take their instructions here, which I'm just going to move over this to the side and move this over to here. Great. Uh, and I'm going to say, well, let's just add from dot slash whatever, right? Now that means it'll only work from this particular directory, but that's okay. Uh, let's copy the path and we'll say copy that path, right? So from here, it will use this particular model file. Great. I'm going to say save that. Uh, and now we can go back over to my terminal and I can follow again, follow the instructions here and say, oh, llama create a yt sample uh, dash f model file right and it'll, be, it'll build out uh it'll, it'll basically tell olama to take its cues from this particular giga file and it will simply call it um it'll, it'll call it yt sample Cool. We cut out a few seconds there, but basically the thing took about 20 seconds to complete. Um, and it creates a, a layer and writes a layer. And when you see things writing layers, you start to wonder the sort of using some Docker code behind the scenes. But leaving that issue aside, I can do now Olama, de, uh, Olama list. And it will show me not only the Llama 2 that I previously downloaded, but also my YT sample. And now I can do uh, Olama run YT sample. Well, there we go. Keep in mind you don't get autocomplete for um, these model names. And I can ask it, why, oh, why is this guy so blue? And we'll see whether it tells us about where it's gathering. Yeah, right. See, and now it talks about where it's gathering. So this allows me from the command line to have all the chats I'd like to have. So. Uh, now we can say, um, uh, let's see, uh, slash question mark to get the list of commands and uh, show to see information about this particular model. Uh, oh, uh, show ITs. Oh, show uh, more specific information about model file, uh, which is just the fact that it came from the from, right? And this is what it downloaded from, and then what the template is, which is not very exciting. Okay, so uh, you can you know go learn more, explore more with Llama all on the command line. Now, th there's one more thing I want to show off though, uh, which is uh, as as part of this experimentation, um, I made um, a little utility uh, that if you have installed Node.js, uh, you can have access to as well. And uh, that is um, you know something I'm calling npx uh, Olama CLI, right? And if you have if you have a Node.js installed, you should have access to npx, and uh, you can do npx olama cli because uh, you know npm js.com 
a package Olama CLI, which actually something I, I created uh, just uh, just over the course of this weekend, uh, but which also demonstrates how you can just implement a little bit of code to make this thing even more useful from a command line point of view. One of the things you probably noticed is that I'm able to do a chat from the command line, but chats from the command line are perhaps less friendly than like what we could do over at LM Studio. So like, how can uh, I make Olama more useful even than uh, than than LM Studio? And that is where things get pretty cool. Uh, because I, there is a library uh, that sits on top of Olama uh, that was made by one of the Olama uh, maintainers. It's called Olama Node, which I can go click on here. Olama Node. And the cool thing about Olama Node is it provides a library to communicate with Olama if you've installed it on your machine, i.e. if the uh, little icon is is up there in your in your bar. Uh, because then I can use its API, and I added this to make a little CLI for it. That way, instead of having to say run, I can just say, you know, npx Olama CLI, why is the sky blue? Um, and it actually has a couple of other features that are pretty handy. But the first thing, the most important, is I can just run something on the client and it will just deliver this back to standard output. So from the point of view of creating like a shell script or an automation, this just works, right? As long as the llama's been installed on the machine, and I'm not going to say that it's going to win LAN speed records. I mean, it is running on your local machine. Um, but it is, uh, it's pretty cool that it's able to produce this. And that just went to standard output, which means I can just feed it to the next element in my pipeline. I can put it into a file using like redirect or, or, or whatever else I want, right? From a shell scripting point of view, uh, you know, sort of lightweight automation, it becomes pretty helpful. But the other thing I can do is, and, and by the way, if you want the full output, uh, like, you know, finding out, you know, uh, how long it took and what the temperature was, et cetera. You can, you can uh, get all that through just asking for the JSON output. Um, but there's one more thing that it does, which is most of these models think in terms of markdown, but they can do things like code generation. So I could do NPX, you know, Olama CLI, um, you know, take the numbers one, two, three, and format them as a JSON, uh, you know, JSON array. Right now, ordinarily, if I do this, uh, it will do a little throat clearing, explain a bit of the code, but it will create it in the form of, you know, markdown and this little markdown indication of like where the code starts and stops. Well, since we know that's going to be markdown, we know that's where the code's going to start and stop. What we can do is, you know, introduce just a little bit of logic, which is exactly what I've done in here to say, add code to it. And instead it will just output the JSON. And then I could pipe that to something like JQ, you know, to go find out the first element in there or something. And it will tell me what the, you know, <laughs> first item is um, by using, you know, querying, you know, JSON or, or whatever it might be. Um, you can feed that into like other inputs or, or, or send that off as a payload to a web request or, or whatever it is you're going to find to be most helpful. Um, but the idea uh, is that in addition, you can you know, spit back the JSON this way. You can spit back, you know, code that gets created. You can turn around to pipe that, say, okay, please run that in Python or Java or Node or whatever. Um, but the, what this starts to do is sort of expand our universe of what we can do with this technology beyond just making chatbots. We can create things that really automate for us. And rather than saying, hey, we're, we're reaching out into the cloud and allowing the cloud into our machines, we're bringing this piece of code locally and being able to run it without requiring any network connection. If I were to turn off my Wi-Fi entirely, this thing continues to work and continues to give me pretty good insights, uh, which I find just really, uh, really remarkable. Um, this is all made possible by um, the, the, the efforts of of, of, of this engineer uh, and the and, and the team that he's been putting together um, and the um, uh, and, and what was originally the GPT for all initiative and now is the and, and then for a while there was GGML and now there's GGUF uh, which I think is the GG you know, universal format uh, which is the main way that we are formatting these uh, models now all made possible through a couple projects that, uh, that this group has put together, one of which is called llama.cpp. And the idea is that it is a set of code that is designed to efficiently run these models using ordinary CPUs. 
Uh, and so what we were doing is we were formatting the models that previously were designed for Hugging Face PyTorch and like, you know, uh, uh, designed with uh, Hugging Face transformers in mind that were going to take advantage of big, heavy CP, uh, GPUs for the purpose of doing all the training um, and turns it into a format that is easily portable, just downloadable, just like we did here, uh, that responds to some relatively uh, standard types of inputs. Um, and... Um, and you know, and, and then we can run it locally on these much lower powered machines. Right now, it runs pretty well on both Intel machines as well as Apple Silicon. And I'm really looking forward to what can happen next with it, because the ability to take these models and run them in a way that is under your control and making about your model is really where I think the future is of all this. Okay, hopefully uh, this has given you a little bit of an intro to Olama. Hopefully this has given you the idea that you can be bringing whatever models and whatever use cases you think are going to be most helpful to you, and maybe some ideas of what you can do to extend it just a little bit further, making use of not just Olama, but you know maybe the Olama CLI, um, or, or other tooling that you might bring to bear uh, to make your own extraordinary applications uh, that are leveraging this, um, this very cool AI technology. Um, certainly AI is usually part of the toughest 5%, and that's the kind of thing that we're always working on over at State Change, um, you know, for, for AI, no-code, low-code projects, uh, and for automations. And, um, you know, if you've got questions about what we've been seeing here, please put them into the comments. We'd love to keep the conversation going. And if you've got particularly challenging things for your, you know, economically meaningful projects, uh, please check us out over at State Change. I'll see you next time.